You know, I've never been known for for being shy or not taking risks. Uh, I, I believe life is short and we all have that problem. And the faster we can figure this stuff out, the better for all of us. Um, and, you know, there's no point in us realizing at the end of our lives we were born one or two generations too early to reap the benefit. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in a rush. I, I, I want the world to reach the place that I know it's going to reach, uh, a world that's as different today as we are from 100 years ago in terms of medicine. Uh, and so, yeah, it was an interesting journey. I, I like to push boundaries scientifically. Um, I think that, you know, I've, I've read a lot of scientific history and, you know, no, no theory lasts forever except maybe the second law of thermodynamics. And really, we're just humans trying to figure this stuff out. And the more dialogue, discourse, new ideas, you know, uh, testing those ideas, the better, right? That's how progress is made. Actually, the, the theory began when I was uh, 20 six years old on that. So it, it wasn't just last year that I came up with this idea, but the it's been evolving um, over time. And um, I've been wanting to write down the theory in a scientific journal in a formal way, uh, but I've just been too busy um, working on the science out there in the lab and doing other things. So I, it turns out just through lack of time that the book was the best way for me to express my ideas and it's, it's unusual. We were talking uh, before we went on air about how rare it is that a scientist puts their work out in public, their theory um, in a book before it's actually totally crystallized and written down in a scientific paper and, and vetted. And that's just how history happened uh, in my case. But the idea has start, began really with yeast cells. We were studying yeast cells and the silent information regulators, these sur proteins that we've been working on, that word information has been there since the beginning, uh, going back 25 years ago. And how is information tied into aging itself? Well, in yeast, it didn't take long to figure out that epigenetic changes, as we call them, the noise of informational noise was the cause of aging, a major cause of aging in yeast. But it's taken us, oh, the better part of uh, two decades to test and to understand whether that was true for us. And while you can do a yeast experiment in a week, a mouse experiment, the ones that we just put up online, um, not the one, not the reprogramming one, but a couple of others, they took us 10 years, those two papers. And I felt like we were at a point where we had enough evidence from our research and, and increasingly other people who are working in this area that this hypothesis was going to come out anyway, kind of like Charles Darwin uh, would have gotten scooped if he hadn't written Origin of the Species, so he rushed it out. The same thing was happening to me. I spent 10 years going, ha ha, no one, no one else is uh, thinking this way in terms of information. But then the epigenome exploded in, in the aging field. The Horvath clock, the epigenetic clock came out. And I thought, well, I, I better get this out or you know, I'll really regret it for the rest of my life. And so it all spilled out on the pages Quite beautifully, I think, thanks to my co-author, who's a really great writer. Um, and together we produced something that, that was far better than we could have produced alone. But what I've been very encouraged by is the reaction of, of my colleagues, that for many of them, it, it just makes perfect sense. If you distill down biology to its essence and ask, why don't organisms live forever? Why isn't life permanent? It's got to be information loss. There's nothing else it could be.